And our two special guests tonight, Tom Carey, Don Schmidt, as they are witness to Roswell, unmasking the government's biggest cover-up. We'll be back with both of them in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. So there was a nurse at a local hospital in Roswell, New Mexico, who apparently told the mortician, Glenn Dennis, about the bodies that she had seen. She was distraught. Uh, They were never able to verify the story on the Glenn Dennis end. And Tom and Don, let's let you pick it up because you say you think you have found the nurse or you did find the nurse. Uh, George, if you will allow me, uh, before Don picks up on the nurse story. Okay. Uh, regarding the the flight of the straight flush, as we call it, uh, I just counted them up. There were there were 11 crew members on that flight. We attempted to locate everyone. We, we did locate uh, all but just a few. And uh, those we were not able to uh, to uh, interview are, are presumed to be dead now. So we did try to locate everybody. And uh, when uh, Arthur mentioned that uh, uh, when they were uh, all uh, after the flight, they were gotten together and uh, told that if you talk about it, you'll uh, I think. Uh, Art said, uh, you'll find yourself in Fort Worth. Mm-hmm. He meant Fort Leavenworth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, there, there, was, there was also, we also tried, to, and we did locate the flight ops officer, the flight operations officer on that flight. Mm-hmm. And his name was Edgar Skelly. And uh, Don can tell this story that uh, that we actually did interview him on a uh, on I think the most difficult type of interview to do is a cold uh, interview where you go up and knock on your the the person's door and uh, uh, introduce yourself and uh, you know, on our team Don is that specialist that he is the one that goes to the front door <laughs> and uh, does those interviews and maybe Don can share you uh, share with you and your audience what. Uh, resulted with his interview with Edgar Skelly. Okay, let's do that. Uh, and, I, and I don't like to leave without getting some information. <laughs> Once I'm there, in fact, uh, we pinned him down in um, his home in Riverside, California. And he uh, actually answered the door wearing a bathrobe, so he had to excuse himself to go dress. And as his wife led me into the front room, she knew who I was, and she kept saying, you have to get him to talk. He needs to finally talk. Every time I see something on TV, I say, honey, I know you were there. Why can't you tell me? And he'll leave the room. So she saw this as one last effort. And he was a masterful dodger in that he always tried to change the subject on me. Mm-hmm. And he clearly, I mean, he's in the base yearbook. He was identified by all of these crewmen on that specific flight, Major Edgar Skelly, he was the one. And it always came back to, I can't remember, I can't remember. And no matter what name I would throw out, I can't remember. But then he always came back to me. Now, why do you need to know about this? Why is this so important to you? And if he couldn't remember, why would he even ask that? Right? Precisely, precisely. And then he, he, he suggests that, well, you know, I was in a minor car accident a few weeks ago. I hit my head, and I'm having a hard time remembering. Ah, yeah. But yet when I was finally leaving, and I asked him for a shortcut back to L.A., he knew exactly how to ah. lay it out for me. So I said, well, thank God that car accident didn't uh, <laughs> cause any permanent damage. But um, what was interesting is that, when I left, I asked his wife if I could have people such as Arthur and others on the crew actually call her, give her some ammunition, and possibly lead up to a confrontation, you know, directly with her husband. Sure. And she thought it was a wonderful idea. And I talked to, like, Robert Slusher, Lloyd Thompson, also on that flight. They agreed. I call her back some weeks later, and she says to me, don't ever call this number again. I am not to ever talk to you again. Wow, she just turned on you. Yes, exactly. So one can well imagine how she would have been read the riot act after we had left. So again, and this was just in the last 10 years. So again, what yeah. is, you know, what's going on? What's for going on yeah. after all this time that, 
these people still live in such fear. That's true. Now, now, and tell me now about the nurse, and then we'll move on. But, yes, okay. uh, I'm just You've just got my curiosity okay. on this story. <laughs> well, uh, and it was through a secondhand witness, someone who had actually worked at the Walker Airfield at the base hospital back around 1960. And she worked with a nurse, a fellow nurse who suggested, well, or mentioned that, well, I was back here in 47 when the bodies came in from that flying saucer crash. And there wasn't much more said about it, but then Tom was the one who was the most instrumental in actually tracking down this very witness, this very woman. And we had a female investigator, Wendy Connors, actually go to the house when we located her. And she was especially interested in the affidavit that was shown her of Glenn Dennis. In fact, she wouldn't take her eyes off of it. She kept reading it. In fact, she even asked, was Glenn the one who told you about me? Huh. And huh. this woman's name was Mary Lowe. We identify her in the book. We have her picture. And she just, no, wasn't me, wasn't there. Didn't matter what anybody else said. Didn't matter that there were witnesses to my making such comments of being involved. Right. And then the very afternoon, we confronted Glenn Dennis. And without so much as mentioning her name, he responded, oh, you mean Mary Lowe. She knows everything about this. So it caused us to step back and say, well, maybe Glenn wasn't misleading us. Maybe he, for whatever reason, gave us the wrong name. And I personally, I think Tom would agree, he was much closer to the nurse that he's ever been willing to let on to. <laughs> uh, his first wife is still alive, and he was married with his second wife at that time. But anyway... The next day, when we once again would confront Glenn, he retracted, he recanted. I never mentioned her. She wasn't involved. Don't ever bring it up again. It's like somebody got to him, too. Or she called him and said, right. how dare you, how could you possibly have betrayed that, you know, our confidence in this story. And uh, end of story. We tried repeatedly after that. Um, we know there were nurses involved. We've had other nurses who we've suspected. And amazingly enough, even the nurses in M Squad, in the medical squad, in the yearbook, they all died rather young. Not that there was anything nefarious you know, in, no, you know, involved there, but it must have been a hard life. They uh, must have... Unlike the Kennedy assassination, where all the witnesses seemed to disappear. Huh? Right, correct. Yeah. But we had tracked down another nurse who uh, Rosemary McManus in a nursing home before she passed away. And all she would say was that based on all the unknown doctors and nurses who literally stormed the base hospital, all of a sudden they just all showed up, showed up out of nowhere. She said clearly something big had happened. Do you two see a smoking gun at all on this Roswell case? Well, there are... Uh, we talk about a smoking gun and the Holy Grail. To us, the smoking gun is the the Ramey memo. This is the uh, uh, picture uh, taken on July the 8th, 1947, of General Ramey kneeling with the weather balloon. At with the, all the debris out there, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I remember that. And, the, and, he's, uh, and he's holding something. Yes. Okay. He's, uh, there were, if I remember, there were seven six or seven pictures seven, taken yeah. at that uh, press conference, and uh, Ramey is in four of them, two by himself and two with his uh, uh, adjutant, uh, Thomas uh, DuBose, Colonel DuBose. And uh, you can tell by the – he's holding a uh, what appears to be a telex in his hand. 